Good evening. We are back with the autobiography of Nina Simone. I put a spell on you because you're mine. Actually, it's not called all of that. It's just called I put a spell on you. Autobiography of Nina Simone. And we stopped at the end of chapter three. Last time we met, I put a little day in between there. Let's call it a day between semesters. <laughs> And this is chapter four. When Curtis turned me down, Curtis is not a man. Curtis is a school. Okay. So when Curtis turned me down, I was changed forever. When Mrs. Miller paid for my piano lessons and Miss Mazzy started the fund, I'd seen it as the rich helping the poor, like Christian people were supposed to do. The questions I might have asked, like why it was I was, the questions I might have asked, like why it was always black women like mama who cleaned the houses for white people like Mrs. Miller. I never did. I knew prejudice existed. I just never thought it could have such a direct impact on my future. Nobody told me that no matter what I did in life, the color of my skin would always make a difference. I learned that bitter lesson from Curtis. To get away from music, I took a job as an assistant in a photographer's darkroom and found I enjoyed the stupid monotony of the work. I just had to lift the film in and out of different solutions each time the bell rang. It left me free to think about anything that came to my head. I was a stranger to the piano. Mama was pleased. At least I was doing something instead of sitting around saying nothing like I'd done for days after the news from Curtis came through. In a way, I included Mama in the bitterness, I felt, because she turned aside from all the plans we'd made. It was God's will that I failed as a music musician and would spend the rest of my life working for peanuts, just as it had been God's will that I should waste my childhood preparing the, for this humiliation. At least that's how I thought I, she saw it. And the fact that Mama had experienced terrible disappointments before and her instinct was to put them behind her and get on with her future it didn't occur to me. I was too innocent. Carol had an older head. Carol had an older head. He kept saying I had to get back to serious study. And if we tried hard enough, the money could be got somehow. There was always a way in Carol's mind. We, would, we wouldn't give up on it. Night after night, and eventually I let myself be persuaded. The real truth was I missed playing too much. With the tiny amount of fund money left, I enrolled as a private pupil with Valdemir Sokoloff, who had, would have been my tutor, who would have been my tutor had I gotten into Curtis. He encouraged me to consider taking the examination again the following year. At first, I couldn't stop thinking about what might have been, but after a couple of lessons, Professor Sokoloff said I really should have been a scholarship student and that at last I knew for sure how good I was. Once the terrible insecurity of wondering if I had overestimated my talent was gone, my bitterness went too. I was still angry, but it was a healthy anger. I made the decision to get back into music and find a way anyway to pay for my studies. I would be the first black classical concert pianist no matter what. Somebody told me a local singing teacher needed an accompanist, and so I went for the job. The Arling Smith studio was big, dusty, and it was a room on the first floor of what used to be a furniture warehouse owned by Arlene herself, a white lady. She gave singing lessons to teenagers who couldn't sing and charged their optimistic parents $10 an hour for the privilege. She made good money, helped by the fact that she only paid her accompanist a dollar an hour. She had a little room around the corner from the studio where her housekeeper, Odessa, cooked hot meals for the staff, which was supposed to help make up for the low wages. It didn't, but when Arlene offered the, me the job, I took it, because at least it had to do with music. I was a good accompanist. I knew how to improvise. I could play any song in any key, so I made the students sound good, better than they would sound when they were without the piano, and better than they really were. When their parents came to check on them, another girl, Ingrid, was working there when I arrived, doing the same job as me. She never said much, 
She just chewed her gum right through the lessons, blowing huge bubbles as her students struggled through my feeling funny Valentine or near to you. We taught mainly popular songs and standards. The kids loved the latest hits. Their parents loved the old favorites. And we liked anything we hadn't played before. So when they asked us for a song to learn, we'd rummage about in our minds or, or in the sheet music for some old show tune nobody had heard of. I didn't know many numbers when I started, but Arlene ran through the most popular ones and I picked up the rest as I went along. I held them in my head rather than use sheet music and I, that saved time. Working eight hours a day, five days a week, I earned $50. $25 went to my lesson. I gave what I could to mama and I lived off the rest. I practiced for four or five hours a day outside of work, so I didn't get out too much. I went to church on Sundays and occasionally saw a European film at an art house theater. I went on Sunday, Saturday afternoons, usually on my own, but sometimes with a girlfriend. I went with Ingrid one time, but her bubbles nearly drove me crazy. So that was the one and only time we went together. Could you imagine sitting next to Nina Simone, blowing bubbles and popping them and blowing them and popping them? <laughs> and then she's like, we don't go to the movies together anymore. Arlene soon trusted me to take the lessons unsupervised. The kids were always very uptight in the way that they sang. It was a struggle getting them to put any feeling into the lyrics, and I had to sing the words myself to show them how to do it. I never thought much about my voice, but I knew how to carry a song without any problem, which was more than most of them could do. And when they tried to copy me, it usually sounded a little better than it had before. Working in the studio like that, trying to help some spotty teenager sound like Frank Sinatra was the first time I ever earned money singing. It took me a few months to settle into this life, moving between my own classical training and into the studio. But soon I got on top of the routine and decided to find a place of my own. The problem was money. I figured the only way to do it was for me to quit the studio and give private tuition where I could charge $2.50 an hour, so I quit, set myself up as a private tutor, and rented a storefront, which was, which was a studio during the day and my bedroom at night. Arlene wasn't too happy because I took eight of her students with me at half price compared to her, and things cooled between us. I wonder why the editor didn't catch that. So she charges them $2.50 an hour, right? And she said that it was half price. Earlier, she said that Arlene charged $10 an hour. So I'm just wondering why the editor didn't catch that and make it clear. Or maybe it's me reading it and I don't get it because I'm like half a 10 is five and I sure want her to make five instead of 250. So I quit the, quit the studio during the day. So I, I'm reading something more. Arlene wasn't too happy because I took eight of her students with me at half price compared to her and things cooled between us. But eventually she forgave me and even offered a little part-time work at the studio, which helped me when sometimes, helped me sometimes when times were hard. My storefront on 57th Street and Master was just that, a storefront that opened out into the street. The last owners had gone broke. No shop people wanted it, so I got it cheap. I had my own place and my own money to spend, although I still gave mama some money every week. So I had a lot of fun fixing my place up. I made curtains, then bought furniture, pictures, a little phonograph, and a few records. My pupils came during the day, and in the evening, when the last of them had gone, I draw the curtains across and sit at the piano with Sheba, my dog, rubbing against my feet while I prepared my weekly lesson with Valdemir Sokoff. It wasn't a an exciting life, but it was a kind of a kin it wasn't an exciting life, but I was kind of contented. And if things got a little quiet, there was always church to look forward to. Sometimes you meet the most interesting people in church. Ed's mother was a preacher too. She and Mama were good friends, and Ed was a baritone in the choir. The first time I saw him, he was singing semi classics, the sort of the sort of songs daddy liked. He was tall, good looking, and very neat, almost vain. I hadn't gone out with anybody since Edney, apart from the one brief episode in New York when I'd 
run into an old friend from North Carolina. We were both missing home and finding Harlem a little too much to deal with, and we looked at each other with delight. And we met by chance on the street. That day, as ever, I was missing Edney, and this boy who knew who knew him in the I was missing Edney, and this boy who knew him in who knew him. I'm sorry that I, I got to read that nice and smooth. I'm sorry. I was missing Edney and this boy who knew him and was from home took his place that night. It wasn't what I expected, not at all. It hurt like hell and put me off the whole idea of men for a good while. But when Ed came up after church one week and asked to walk me home, just like Edney, when I was 12, I said yes. We went back to my storefront and I pulled the curtains across and sent Sheba out to play. When she got back, I was purring. I went with Ed for some time and he even talked about getting married with me, which was when I finished with him. But he taught me a lot. I had never had a real boyfriend all the way through. And by the time I finished with Ed, I knew I would never be innocent again. The whole time I wished he could have been Edney. Mostly I was on my own, working hard, practicing, isolating myself. I saw very few people and none of the men I knew in Philadelphia meant anything much to me. I lived like this for almost three years, trying to save enough money to stop working and dedicate myself to music and not getting anywhere near it. I began to feel uneasy because I didn't seem to fit in with any of the people I met. I wasn't making friends. I started seeing a psychiatrist named Jerry Wise and I went to his office for analysis every Thursday for a year. I'd lie on his couch and talk, do free association and stuff. I liked doing it, but although Jerry became a friend, so in a way the analysis worked. I didn't feel it was going to do me any good, so I stopped. My only real friend in Philadelphia was a woman named Faith Jackson. Her customers knew her as Kevin Mathias, and she was a whore. I wasn't shocked when she told me that because seeing those brightly dressed ladies in Harlem had taught me that there were a lot more to the women on the streets than mama would have ever had me believe. I kind of lived through her. I never envy people's careers or money. I envy their freedom. I think I was more envious of Kevin than of any woman I'd ever known. She was free. She was beautiful and she could get men all the time. They gave her money and clothes, and what they didn't give her, she bought for herself. She always wore the most beautiful shoes, and her men did what she wanted, or she got rid of them. She had no pimp because she never needed one. She was totally independent and took care of everything herself. I admired her, and she must have seen something like that in me because she gathered me under her wing and took me along to parties sometimes, introducing me to her friends. I can't remember how we met, but she lived nearby and somehow we drifted together. That was unusual enough given how different we were. But life with Kevin could be strange like that. She came around one time to invite me to Christmas dinner at her apartment. When I asked if I should bring anything or would she like me to help with some cooking, she laughed. <laughs> On Christmas day, her elegant, I'm sorry. On Christmas day, her apartment was spotless. Kevin was stretched out on the sofa looking elegant. The smell of roasted turkey came from the kitchen and a man appeared, took my coat, and offered me a drink. Kevin didn't say anything. She just smiled. When he went back into the kitchen, she explained, he was a John, a customer, who paid her to let him cook and serve, him Christ and serve Christmas dinner at her home. All she had to do was go in every half an hour or so and beat him with a whip. I swear this is true. I almost died. Okay, so do you all remember when we were re reading the um, autobiography of Malcolm X and he was talking about being in New York and the peculiar sexual appetites of his, um, the people he worked with, you know, powdering them and beating them and all kind of craziness. So anyway, this, um, this is also something Nina Simone, Simone talks about. So it's true. 
Kevin went to Atlantic, Atlantic City every summer because guys spend money on holiday and she always did good business at resorts. Other, pe other Philly people I knew, older kids I taught who were in college, worked down there during the summers when the hotels took on extra staff. Early in 1954, I talked to some of my students about it. Most of them were going to be waiters or bellhops, but one kid said he was going to be working in a bar playing the piano. I looked at him kind of strange because all the people, because of all the people, I was the one to know he couldn't play for beans, but he just grinned and shrugged and said back, yeah, I know, but they're gonna pay me $90 a week. I thought about it a while. $90 a week was double what I earned and that was just what the bar paid. If the customers liked you, there were going to be tips on top. The next time I saw the kid, I got the number of his agent and I called the guy up. I wasn't nervous, figuring if one of my students could get a job as a pianist, I surely could. Sure enough, the guy called back and told me I had a job for the summer at a place called the Midtown Bar and Grill. The only problem was that Mama finding out I was going to be playing in a piano bar to her, that wouldn't be any different from working in the fires of hell. I could already hear her voice in my head. A bar? My God. In my own family, I have the devil himself. I couldn't see how Mama would ever find out, but somehow with these sort of things, she always did. Anyhow, if there was a sign on the street saying, playing tonight, Eunice Wayman, it would certainly increase the chances. So I decided that I was going to use a stage name. I'd had a, a Hispanic boyfriend one time, Chico, who had christened me Nina, pronounced it Nina, which was the Spanish word for little one. Chico had called me that all the time and I really loved the way it sounded, Nina. I liked the name Simone too, ever since I'd seen Simone Signorette in the French movies. I'm sorry, it's not Signorette, it's Signore in those French movies. So. There it was. I was going to be Nina Simone. I tried it out on Kevin, who said it sounded very sophisticated. So when summer came, I left Philly as Eunice Wayman, and I arrived in Atlantic City as Nina Simone. The Midtown Bar and Grill was on Pacific Avenue, two blocks back from the, store, the seafront boardwalk. I was told to turn up that first night, introduce myself to the owner, and play. I found the Midtown stood on the sidewalk, building up the, I found the Midtown stood on the sidewalk building up the courage to go in. From outside, the Midtown looked like nothing at all, just a seedy little bar where old guys go to huddle over a drink and fall asleep. And that's exactly what it was. Up to that moment, I had never been into a bar in my entire life. I pushed open the door and my eyes watered from the smoke and my nose twitched as the smell of the place hit me. I walked up to the bar and asked if I could please speak to Harry Stewart, the owner. The barman asked me what I wanted and I told him that I was a new pianist. He said that Harry was a little tied up and would I wait? I said, yes. He asked if I wanted a drink and I asked for a glass of milk. A few of the old Irish guys turned around at the bar and laughed. I blushed. I looked around the corner of my eye. The Midtown was just one long room with the bar stretching two thirds of the way down one wall. Some tables and chairs were laid out in the remaining space and a piano stood on a tiny raised stage in the back. I reckon the entire place could hold about a hundred people if you greased each one and slid them in sideways. There was a door by the end of the bar and behind that door was a room where they put drunks to sleep it off if they'd had too much to make it home. Sawdust was on the floor, a joint, no other word for it. At least, no decent word to call this place. Harry Stewart came out from his room in the back. He was a little Jewish guy and had a fat cigar in his mouth as a permanent fixture. So here's, a, here's the, the, um, the connections too, right? So Richard Wright, when he got his jobs, um, where people were good to him, with Jewish people. Um, Malcolm X, when he got his jobs, where people were good to him. Jewish people. Um, Maya Angelou, Jewish people, and this. So that's just like, there's some history, right? There's some history of 
um, 1940s and 50s who were giving um, giving black people an opportunity to work and also being good to them. Well, we don't know how good he is because I haven't started reading that part. But um, I'll stop talking and start reading it. Jewish guy had a fat cigar in his mouth as a permanent fixture. He took me up to a, the piano, which was okay. And in the roof above the keyboard, exactly over the spot where I would sit was a leaky air conditioning machine. Water was dripping down on the piano stool. Harry went to his office and came out a moment later with a black umbrella, which he opened up and jammed into the ceiling by the air conditioner so that the water dribbled down the side of the umbrella and fell into a little pool in front of one of the tables. Then he stuck a bucket on top of the puddle and told me to come back in an hour and start the work. The guys at the bar must have thought I was from another planet when I walked in that night. The only public performances I had ever given were classical recitals, and all my training in the presentation was for the concert stage. I decided that whatever they might think of me, I was probably the finest pianist they'd ever hear. So I was going to present myself as much. When I came to actually playing, when it came to actually playing, I would get through it by closing my eyes and pretending I was somewhere else, like Carnegie Hall or Metropolitan Opera. So I put on my best long chiffon gown, fixed my makeup, did my hair like I always did, and went to work. Nobody said anything when I walked in, but they all turned to look at me. Harry's cigar almost went out. I sat on stage, a diva, a professional entertainer for the first time, and I played to an audience of drunken Irish bums. The deal was I performed from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. with a break of 15 minutes every hour. For that, I got $90 a week plus tips as much as, and as much milk as I could drink. That first night, the only thing I wasn't nervous about was what to play. I knew hundreds of popular songs and dozens of classical pieces. So, that <clears throat> so what I did was combine them. I improvised on those, occasionally slipping in a part from a popular tune. Each song, which isn't the right way to describe what I was playing, lasted anywhere between 30 and 90 minutes. I just sat down, closed my eyes, and drifted away on the music. On my first night, one song I played lasted for three hours without a break. The guys in the bar were used to pianists playing no more than a half a dozen tunes in each set and usually repeating the same set over and over again. When I played, they never heard the same song twice in a night. When I was really flying, they didn't hear the same song once. I used no sheet music because it was all in my head. Between sets, I sat on my, at my, wait. Between sets, I sat on my own at the bar drinking milk in my long chiffon gown. Nobody said a word to me all night. So that first evening, I closed my eyes and played. 4 a.m. came around and they started piling up the drunks in one side room and putting chairs on tables, getting ready to close up. Harry was waiting for me at the bar when I finished, and I asked him if everything had gone all right. He was very nice about my plan and said he liked it. But there was just one thing. Why hadn't I sung? I looked at him. I'm only a pianist, I said. He took his cigar out of his mouth. Well, tomorrow, you either sing. Wait, well, tomorrow... Let me get it right. Well, tomorrow night, you're either a singer or you're out of a job. So the next th night I sang as well. It wasn't hard to fit into improvisation because I used my voice as a third layer, layer complementing the other two layers, my right hand and my left hand. When I got to the part where I used elements of popular songs, I would simply sing the lyric and play around with it repeating single lines over again, repeating verses, changing the order of the words. It was fun. Harry liked it too, so everybody was happy. Before I started at the Midtown Bar, my musical life was separated into two halves. The tuition I gave at my storefront was simply a way of earning money to keep up my studies. I didn't even think of it as music. It was just a job. Because I spent so long accompanying untalented students, I began, began to despise popular songs, and I never played them for my own amusement. Why should I when I could be playing Bach or 
Serzny or Litz. This was real music. And I found, and in it, I found happiness. I didn't have to share it with anybody. So the only way I could stand playing in the Midtown was to make my set as close to classical music as possible without getting fired. This meant that I had to include some popular music and I had to sing, which I'd never thought of doing. The strange thing was that when I started doing it, to bring the two halves together, I found a pleasure in it almost as deep as the pleasure I got from classical music. Playing at the Midtown made me looser and more relaxed about music. I was creating something new because that came out of me. Because I had to play seven hours a night, I started to improvise, but I didn't know I could do it until I had to do it. When I sat down at the piano on my first night, I had no idea of the shape of the music I would play. It just came out without my thinking. The first original music I ever played, I was repressed to the point where I hadn't played any of my own songs before because I didn't know I had them down there somewhere inside of me. I didn't know until they came out. They came out with box technique, but they were my songs and I wrote new ones every night. Toward the end of my first week at the Midtown, I noticed that late in the evenings, new customers appeared and kept telling the old guys to quiet down when, she was, when I was playing. Between sets, I looked at the audience and saw that there were a few younger customers in. The following nights, they were there again, always after about 1.30 a.m. And they had friends with them who were coming to the Midtown for the first time. Then someone came up and complimented me on my playing. I got a big kick from that. But after a couple of weeks, it was unusual if I didn't get complimented. It seemed like I wasn't the only one who was enjoying my music. I was starting to get the reputation around town, spread the word, spread by word of mouth by people. Mm. I was starting to get a reputation around town, spread through word of mouth by people who drifted into the midtown by chance. These people were students working in Atlantic City and they came late because they didn't finish their own work until after midnight. A lot of the regular old Irish guys started leaving when the kids arrived and some stopped coming altogether and Harry didn't mind. The place was fuller than it ever had been for years. They liked me so much that they'd come to the Midtown early on the, their evenings off and they'd bring their friends with them. My attitude to performing was that of a classically trained musician. All right, so this is gonna be the explanation because she's so classy, right? Just a queen every time on stage. My attitude about performing was that of a classically trained musician. When you play, you give all of your concentration to the music because it deserves total respect and an audience to sit still and be quiet. That's how I played at the Midtown and my students understood it. If a drunk started shouting or farting, farting, <laughs> farting too, if a drunk started shouting or fighting while I was playing, it broke my concentration, so I stopped playing until they were quiet. And if they weren't quiet, I wouldn't play. When that happened, my students would grab the guy and throw him on out on the street. My attitude to live audience was formed there at the Midtown, and it's never changed. No matter who the audience is, how big or small the concert hall is, if an audience disrespects me, it is insulting to the music that I play, and I will not continue. Because if they don't want to listen, then I don't want to play. And audiences chooses to come and see me perform. I don't choose the audience. I don't need them either. And if they don't like my attitude, then they don't have to come and see me play. Others will. She, she, a brown body she thinks a brown body has 
has no glory. If she could dance naked under palm trees or see her image in the river, she would know. Yes, she would know. But there are no palm trees in the street. No palm trees in the street. And dish water gives back no images. She, she. does not know her beauty. She thinks her brown body, she thinks her brown body has no If she could dance naked on the palm trees or see her image in the river, she would know. Yes, she would know. But there are no palm trees in the street no palm trees in the street and dishwater gives